Our text this morning is Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And that word chosen, according as he hath chosen us in him, is the Greek word from which we get elect. It even sounds like the Greek word does, even sounds like our English word elect. Election, beloved, is not a scary threatening word and there's something wrong in the people who thinks that it is a scary threatening word election is a rich comforting word to the child of God and those who read and understand and love the Bible appreciate the frequency and significance of such words as elect Elected, election, and choice, chosen, and predestinate, and predestination, and foreknow, and foreknowledge, and beloved. And the truth and consolation of election is especially known and experienced in the Reformed churches, because this great doctrine was rediscovered and preached with power from the 16th century onwards, especially. And it has been set forth in all the great Reformed creeds, especially in our Canons of Dort, in Head 1, entitled, Of Divine Predestination. And this means it is part of our peculiar heritage and treasure. And what do you do with the treasure? You treasure it. Usually we think of the election of individuals. It's very important to stress this as many verses in the Bible do. That God has chosen particular sinners to everlasting life in Jesus Christ. Including the truth that God has chosen one particular sinner, me, to eternal life. That's crucial. Everyone must be assured of that in him or herself. And true and extremely important as is the election of individuals, including me, says the child of God, the election of individuals is not the whole of election because election is also corporate of a group the bible teaches both both the election of individual people and the election of the church which is the body of jesus christ let me read part of our text emphasizing the corporate nature of election. God, says verse 3, has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen or elected us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. And if you ask, how do we relate the election of particular persons and the election of the church? It's very easy. It is the particular elect individuals and them alone who constitute the elect church. And God chose many individual people in order to form the corporate body of Christ 
so that the election of particular people serves the election of the church. It's good to know that God has chosen me, but the election of the church doesn't so much serve me, but the election of me serves the election of the church. Election is of individual people, but it is not individualistic. The personal aspect of election serves the communal, the body of Jesus Christ. And each individual child of God has been eternally chosen to salvation in order to serve Christ's church in the way and place and role in which he has determined for us. And we need to go further to round out our subject and see it in its proper shape. Not only does the election of individuals serve the elect church, but the election of the church serves the elect Christ. So that even in this too, Jesus Christ has the preeminence. Election is for Christ's sake. Election is designed to glorify him. So the election of individuals serves the election of the church. The election of the church serves the elect Christ. And the election of Christ serves the electing God. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's look this morning at election, the source of the church. Election, the source of the church. First, the glorious meaning, and second, the practical significance. The glorious meaning of election is the source of the church, and the practical significance of the election as the source of the church. Now sometimes people wonder why there is a world at all. Don't know if you ever have. Why is there something rather than nothing? Don't know if you ever thought about that. I remember as an unbelieving boy being troubled by that. Why do I exist? Why is there something? Where did it all come from? And the Bible gives the answer to this. Creation. God freely willed there to be a something outside of himself. And he brought it to pass. There is this similar question. Why is there a church at all? And you ought certainly to think this. Why is there a church? This is the right way to think. Why is there a church? Why is not everybody an unbeliever? Why is that? What accounts for that? Why are there on this filthy, sinful planet some (coughs) regenerate persons who worship the true and living God? Why in the midst of a fallen world in which everybody condemns God in their thinking and ignores him when they're not condemning him? Why are there some people who honor him in their hearts and words and lives? And why not only is there a church, but why is there a church in all ages? Why wasn't it the case that for a couple of hundred years there was nobody who believed at all? Why is there always that continuity? And why is the church in certain places and not others? In 2017 and throughout the history of this world. Why was there a church in Ephesus in the first century, whereas there was no church in Beijing? Why is there a church here today, whereas in certain parts of the world there is no church and why is there a church why did there used to be a church in a certain place at a certain time whereas today there is no church there and then let's go further 
Why is the church precisely the size that it is? And why isn't it bigger? Or, which is just as important a question, why isn't it smaller? And then, why does the church consist of certain specific people, including us, and why not other people? Why not the other people who live on the same street with you? Why you, and why not them? And the answer to each and every one of those questions, why, is election. An election is in the deepest and final analysis, the only answer to all of those questions. Election determines the existence of the church. Election determines the continuance of the church. Election determines the location of the church. Election determines the size of the church. Election determines the members of the church, who's in and who's out. From top to bottom, therefore, it's not too much to say this. From top to bottom, the church is entirely controlled and shaped by God's gracious, unconditional, eternal election. Or, and this is more precise, the church is entirely shaped from top to bottom by the gracious, electing God. Because when we say election, what we really mean is the electing God. All these things are determined by election means they're all determined by God and his choices. And so it is that the Reformed churches have spoken of election as the core, C-O-R, ecclesia. And you may reckon in that, it taught that, Latin word ecclesiae, ecclesiastical, it means church. The core, C-O-R, ecclesiae, which means the heart of the church. The core, C-O-R, Latin for heart of the church. The heart of the church here refers to heart as source or origin. Just as Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, Out of the heart are the issues of life. The issues of life proceed from your heart. What you think in your heart, that's what you are. Out of your heart. Your life proceeds from your heart. What you think. You are what you believe. You are what you think. Out of the heart are all the issues of life. And the heart is used here in the phrase heart of the church in the same way the source or origin of the church is election. Election is the source of the church's existence and continuance and location and size and membership. It's the heart or source of the church in all of those areas. And from the truth of election, we even gain a definition of the church. What is the church? You could define it in various ways from different perspectives. But from this perspective, the church is the company of the predestinated. That's what the church is, the company of the predestinated. The church is not fundamentally a building an institution, the church is the company of the predestined. And this was the teaching especially of John Wycliffe in England and Jan Hus in Bohemia in their battles with the apostate church of Rome. And they were drawing on the biblical truth set forth by Augustine when Rome said, we're right, don't protest our false doctrines. We are the church, we are the institution. We have the Pope as the head of the body. We cannot err. We are church. Listen to church. And Huss said, no, church is the company of the predestined. It's the body of the elect. It takes institutional form. 
though not your form, but essentially it's the totality of the elect. And this is the teaching of the reformers and their successors, this glorious name for the church as the company of the predestinate. And this is the church of which we are living members. And that means you can say, well, our church, when did our church start? When was it organized? And you can pick dates. When, when did I become a member? But you were eternally a member of the body of Jesus Christ according to God's gracious election. And so Jesus Christ taught in John 10, Luke 10, verse 20, Rejoice, beloved, for your names are written in heaven. Not just in some church rule book. They should be written in the church rule book by all means. But the key thing and the number one thing is they're written in heaven. And let us see this from the opening verses of Ephesians 1. Here Paul addresses the church as the saints or holy ones which are at Ephesus and the faithful the believing ones who continue in the truth, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And then Paul says in verses 3 and 4 that this church is blessed. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And then verse 5 adds, just in case somebody fell asleep and missed the reference to election in verse 4, having predestinated us according to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. It's all according to God's will. That's election. It's all according to the pleasure of his will. That's referring to election here too. The good pleasure of his will. Why was there a church at Ephesus? What did the church at Ephesus have to know about itself? Why was the church at Ephesus the size that it was? Why did it have the membership that it had? It was all according to God's gracious eternal election. Because election was the source that is the heart of that church. An election is the source and heart of every church, every true church. And where you have a church that meets on a Sunday, let's say, and there's nobody electing it there, it has its source in the will of man or the will of the devil, but not the will of God. The will of God being election. An election is the source of this church, an eternal decision by God before the foundation of the world. That's why we're here. We ought not let the canonical significance of Ephesians escape us. The theme of this book of Ephesians is the church as the body of Christ. The church as the body of Christ. The subject, therefore, of this book is the church. Christ church. As his body. And more than any of the other 65 books in the inspired canon, Ephesians focuses on this aspect of the truth. And so we go back to our original question. Here's this greatest epistle on the church after its salutation in the first two verses. What does it say? What does it put number one in understanding the church as the body of Christ? What does this book say? Well, it blesses God for his eternal election of the church in Christ. The first thing that Ephesians tells us about the church is that it is elect, chosen in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world and that that election is the source of all of the church's existence and all of the church's blessedness 
And then it says, God has predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will. Just to ram the point home. You could say, therefore, and you'd be entirely correct in saying, that in this book on the church's Christ's body, the apostle starts his grand subject with the truth of election as the heart or source of the church. The first thing Paul says that you Ephesians must know about your congregation, despised as it is in the city of Ephesus, is you're eternally elected in Christ. The church must always know herself as elect and beloved in Jesus. You never think we're a few people going to church on a Sunday morning, making our way through the snow, as is the case today, and not as many with us as usual, and we're no big deal. Well, if you want to talk about no big deal, talk about your sins. Because we really are no deal according to our sins. We're a bad deal according to our sins. Those are forgiven. But our dignity in Christ is that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. The church must take itself seriously. And when the church takes itself seriously, then it doesn't cave into the world and adopt the world's rotten philosophies. It says we have far more dignity than the nonsense you're putting out. We're the elect body of Jesus Christ. Chosen before the creation itself. And everything else in this epistle to the Ephesians about the church follows on from, flows from, and must be understood in the light of her eternal election. And indeed, when we read the Bible, not just Ephesians, and when we think about the church, and it's a grand subject to think about, the church's election in Jesus Christ is fundamental. It is her heart. And if you think that I'm making too big a deal out of Ephesians 1 verses 3 and 4, and I've drawn in verse 5, I want you to know that it is far from the only text in the New Testament epistles to teach the church's election in Christ. Here's 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4. Very like Ephesians 1 verse 4. Quote, Knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. He doesn't just bring up election at the start of Ephesians. He brings it up at the start of 1 Thessalonians after the greeting there too. Here's a church that is only months old. And that's the way it was when Paul wrote this letter. To the church at Thessalonica. And Paul wanted this young church. Brought out of heathendom and paganism. To know the eternal election of the church. And there are congregations today. Hoary with age. Centuries old some of them. And there are members of churches today. Retired people. In those churches. And they don't even know the election of the church. What in all the world has the minister been doing? Have these people ever really understood the Bible? They may have Bibles in the back of their pews. Does anybody read it? Does anybody know what it means? And the last thing in these churches their minister would want to do is teach about election. And he certainly wouldn't be praying that the people would know it. And that's what Paul's doing here in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4. He tells them, I've been praying for you because I know you are elect. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. In case the Thessalonians were asleep and missed what Paul taught in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4, he says, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 in the second canonical epistle to this church, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. 
through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. You must know that about yourself as a church. And it's not just Paul, Peter. Peter taught this to the churches. 1 Peter 1 verse 2. 1 Peter 1 verse 2. After he says, I, Peter, am writing this letter, and you who are receiving it are the believers in Pontus, Galatia, etc. He writes, quote, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Elect. He jumps right into it at the very start, right into these elect people in Turkey and says to them, in effect, this is who you are. Chapter 5, verse 13. Now we go from the very start of the letter to the very end of the letter. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, greets you. So you're elect. First Peter 1 verse 2, the second verse from the start, and then this church in Babylon, modern day Iraq, it's also elect, and it greets you as a church eternally elected. Two eternally collected bodies, although there were more churches in Turkey, greeting each other. 2 Peter 1 verse 10, Wherefore, the rather, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. You need to be sure of your election. And a living, humble consciousness of your election will keep you from stumbling and falling into sin. I'll give you another verse. Colossians 3 verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, and so on. The knowledge of election works love in the membership of the church. Kindness and mercies and humbleness of mind. And if we turn to 2 Timothy... The Apostle makes it clear that he thought that the knowledge of election was vital for preachers. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 God has saved us and called us according to an holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And then he points out in verse 12 that this is to be preached. Chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Which in this context is vital for understanding apostasy. Hymenaeus and Philetus have gone into heresy. Some people believed their lives. Many people fell away. And Paul says, don't worry. The foundation of God stands sure. The Lord knows them that are his in eternal election. Not one of the elect will believe their lives. They will all be preserved in the truth. And for the sake of brevity, I'll omit other references in Paul's epistles in Romans 8, 9 and 11. And the other New Testament books and the Old Testament scriptures. Because election and the election of the church is taught throughout the Bible from beginning to end. As we noticed when we read Deuteronomy 7. The Lord has loved you. Because he loved you. In eternity. Therefore it must be taught and believed. As part of the whole counsel of God. Let's come in closing to the second part of our sermon on the practical significance of election as the source of the church. Some aspects of the practical significance. The knowledge of the election of the church and of us as members of that elect church 
is vital for our sense of belonging. We belong to our faithful God wholly and completely right now. And from your first and effectual call, and you will belong to God, he will see to it, grace is irresistible, and he makes you willing as well, you will belong to him to the very end of your days here, and that ought to be settled in your mind. I will always belong to God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit own me. I have been baptized into his name, inwardly and externally with water. And I will belong to him as part of his inheritance throughout all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. There will never be a time when I won't belong to him. And that's good news. And I belonged to God before I was born. Not only before I was brought to faith, but before I was born. At the cross. Because when Jesus Christ died, I was in him, united to him. And when he died to sin, I died to sin too. And he was raised from the dead, as we saw last week, because I was justified as part of the church. And God couldn't keep him in the grave any longer. And then, to all of that, our text says that we belonged to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the foundation of the world. We've always belonged to him. Always. Because we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We were united to him even then. Our election was an election in Christ. God chose him, the man Christ Jesus, as the one to be united with the second person of the Trinity, a personal union. And God chose us in the chosen one, Christ. Beloved in Christ, the beloved. Belonging to Christ, the one who belongs to the Father. And therefore possessed everlastingly by the triune God. That's election. And now our text especially brings out this. That elect saints belong together in a true reformed church. The individual child of God belongs in the church. And part of your election is your being elected as part of Christ's church. And here and now, part of this church. Because nobody was ever chosen to salvation on his own. You're chosen as part of the body. And now you and I and all the saints on earth and all the faithful who have died before us and all the elect who will yet be effectually called in the future belong together to God in Christ. Because we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world together. And this of course includes all of our elect children. You know the message of verses 1 through 4 of Ephesians 1. Paul writes to the faithful, the saints at Ephesus, and says, Blessed be God who has elected us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And then in this same letter, he writes, Ephesians 6 verses 1 through 3, Children, faithful, saints, Elect, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, for this is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long in the earth. The children are part of the election of the church before the foundation of the world. That's what the connection between Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 6 means. He doesn't say, children, by the way, you're not faithful, you're not saints, you're not part of the elect, you're little vipers, you're enemies of Christ. He includes them 
in the election. Not all, of course, of the physical children of believers are elect, as you well know. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. The elect children of the covenant belong everlastingly in Christ's church. This is helpful for the children and young people to know. It's a bit like being married. Once you've got the right grasp of marriage, you never think to yourself, you know, maybe I'm going to dump this woman five or six years down the line if she gets annoying. You don't, you don't go there. You don't think that. That's ruled out. And the children in the church who believe the scriptures should never think of a future outside the church. You never think of a Lord's Day when you're not in church. You never think of a world in which you're not praying and in which Christ isn't your saviour. The children in the church, the ones who have their heads screwed on right by the grace of God, think, I belong to Jesus Christ, I always will. I don't want it any other way. I can't be lost. My future is illumined by the word of God, the promise of heaven and the eternal election. Yeah, that's me. That's my identity. That's who I am. And that means that we and our children who belong to the church think, I want to belong to a church which teaches the church's proper source. I need to belong to a church which actually knows where the church came from. I could be part of any church institution which didn't teach the election of the church. I need to be in a church where, where I have the three marks, where I know what Christ is. If I was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, I want to be with Christ where he is in the church where he preaches the word, he comes to me in the sacraments, and where he rules through church discipline. And belonging to the church means, for young and old, I attend the meetings, and I listen to the preaching, and I fellowship with these people because I was elected with them. And I pray with them and for them. And I support and encourage them. And I have as my role the role of edifying them. The knowledge of the truth of the election of the church is vital for our whole understanding of ourselves as belonging to Christ and his body. And it's vital too, secondly, for evangelism. Chief means of grace, as you well know, is the preaching of the gospel in the church, which is supported by the witnessing of members. Once you have it straight that the church and the new living members of the church are only ever going to be the elect, then you have no interest in gimmicks. Because gimmicks don't draw the elect. Gimmicks don't work for sheep. Gimmicks work for goats. The last thing you want in the church membership rules is goats. That will not help the church. And the sheep, the elect, they're gathered by the means that God has appointed. The preaching of the word. And this means that the results, when the results are positive, that is when someone's brought the faith and added to the church, since the source of the church and the source of every true member of the church is election, then you don't say, glory to the preacher, because the preacher brought him in. The preacher didn't bring anybody in. The preacher can't bring anybody in. Anybody who could be brought in merely by the preacher is, is, not, is not wheat, but tear. And you don't say, glory to the church, because the church brought the people in. You say, glory to God, because God elected that person. Because as many as were chosen unto eternal life believed. And those who aren't chosen unto eternal life will never believe, can't believe, don't want to believe, and can never be brought into the church apart from by gimmicks. And when the results are negative, you don't despair. You don't say, oh, total waste of time there. You say, with God... My word shall not return unto me void. Many are called externally through the preaching, but few are chosen. 
And there's many more that are called than are chosen. The external call comes to many more than the election. And that was the case with Noah, and the Bible called the preacher of righteousness. And Noah didn't say, we preached for decades all of God's hate in my church. This is awful, I'm going to quit. Noah says, the source of the church is election. God has given me a hard call out to preach, and it's largely a ministry of condemnation. People don't want to hear, but I'll still preach. And Jeremiah had the same difficult calling too. And so even if the church is very small or tiny, the believer who understands the source of the church of eternal election realizes that the church is not confessed on the basis of sight. That's the problem with the world. The world, when it wants a Christian view, goes to the Pope. Huh. Because all it can see is buildings and people and regalia and money. You see the church when you see someone who confesses what the Bible says. That's the church. The Apostles' Creed doesn't say, I see a holy Catholic church. It says, I believe a holy Catholic church. The church is an object of faith. It's not primarily a matter of experience or observation. It is a matter of revelation. And this is the standing lesson to the church in the life of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left. Elijah, there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Believe that and don't go around feeling sorry for yourself. And that's quoted in our Belgian Confession 25 too. And after all that, beloved, we are in a position to see the foolishness, the gross foolishness of ministers and churches in ignoring election and the election of the church. This would be like a little boy of 10 years old who doesn't know where he comes from. Who are your parents from? I don't know. What country are you in? I don't know. Where were you born? I don't know. Do you have any family? How come you're here? I don't know. Well, the church, which doesn't teach its election, doesn't know where it comes from. Doesn't know why it is the size it is. Doesn't know how it has come to consist of the people that it does. And if it doesn't know the real source of its origin, it's going to jump to wrong conclusions. It's going to think, the origin of this church lies in man's free will. We are this church because these people freely of their own wills chose to believe what we teach here and join us. And that's it. The choice of man. The church therefore rests in man's election. Because election means choice. Man's free will. That's the origin of the church. That makes the church thoroughly humanistic and under the wrath of God. Whereas the Christian teaching is that the origin of the church lies not in man's free will. It lies in God's free will. God's choice. God's election. And it's precisely those churches and those ministers who think that the church's origin lies in man's free will who engage in the unbiblical so-called evangelism that they engage in. And they're open to all sorts of innovations to persuade people because they actually believe it's all down to man's free will, not God's will who's in the church. And when you see people engaging in that sort of so-called evangelism, you know they have a wrong view of the church and its origin. That's foolishness. But then there's downright wickedness of the ministers and churches who deny the election of the church. And what they do is they rip the heart out of the church because election is the heart of the church. That is an attack on the church. That's an attack on the church at its source, at its <coughs> origin. And 
And they make their church merely a gather up of people who rightly used their own free will, bully for them, save themselves, that's wonderful. Not, as the Bible says, a temple of God and a body of Christ planned eternally by God. So, beloved, it remains to the true church on earth to bless God. And that's the whole context of our text. Verse 3 begins, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be he, according as he hath elected us in him before the foundation of the world. Bless God. Verse 6, this election and predestination, verse 6 says, is to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory. Verse 14, unto the praise of his glory. And this is why John Calvin in his sermons on Ephesians says... <coughs> Those who deny, or are even reluctant to talk about election, are, quote, mortal enemies of God's praise. Mortal enemies of God's praise. The truth about election, the election of the church, that I've been explaining from Ephesians 1 verse 4, this is precisely the truth that would kill most of the praise of the churches, and most of the praise of the praise leaders and praise groups and praise services in the visible outward church. Teach this, people would be appalled. And people would say, I don't want to praise a God like that. Yeah, there's the problem. You've got the wrong God. You have the wrong God. And the election of the church leads to humility before Almighty God because we didn't choose ourselves. He chose us all of grace. And let us bless God in our hearts as we close by reading the text. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Amen. Father in heaven, bless to us thy word. Humble us and bring out of our hearts more praise and worship. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.